Good morning, y'all. Good to see all of you here. Welcome. Let me remind you to pick up the census booklets at the end of each pew. Sign in. Let us know you are here. We're so glad to have you. If you are joining us online, um, hi, Judy, uh, then um, go ahead and leave a note in the chat. Let us know that you're here and uh, we look forward to seeing those things. I, we will be asking you to turn on your camera when it comes time for passing of the peace so the people here and you can all see each other. <laughs> That's what happens with an old professor, right? Yes. Okay, so we have a couple things to let you know about. The first one is San Angelo Gives. That's this Tuesday, and San Angelo Gives is a wonderful day that we have to support all the nonprofits here in the community, and I invite you to make that part of your giving. Uh, we are asking you, in addition to anything else you'd like to give over and above, um, if you are able, please give your June tithe on May 3rd, and then we will get a little bit of enhancement with that and continue to give your May tithes so that we can continue to pay our bills. So pretty simple right with that. So it's a wonderful day. And I, I was having to do some numbers and I figured the other night that we had done something like over a hundred thousand meals worth of groceries in just the last year. So and then I got the bill for the last time. Prices went up. So, uh, so please uh, remember uh, to support us on May 3rd. We do have another announcement from the lovely and talented Teresa Adams. Oh yeah, they can't hear you without the microphone. I'll even step back down. Or you can go to the table, either place. Uh, the third week in May, for the online folks, okay. The third week uh, in May, we are doing Meals for the Elderly. Sign-up sheet is in the North X, or it's online, and we have that link on Facebook. We only have six routes left, so Lisa, you better go grab them. She took two already, so now we only have four routes left, so thank you. Going once, going <laughs> twice. Who's going to take the fourth route? Okay. Um, I want to highlight also we have a number of book studies going on every Sunday morning at 9, 9.15. Uh, the St. Paul Room class uh, starts up. And shout at me the title, Norm. Uh, this is forgiving, what you can't forgiving What You Can't Forget. And they just got started in that. We also have a Wednesday evening, which normally meets at 7 p.m. That's, that's led by Mike Burnett. That's going to be Traveling Mercies by Anne Lamott. That will begin a week from this Wednesday. So what's that, the 11th? OK, so May 11th. Oh, look, I even put it in the bulletin. It says it right there. And then Thursday at noon, we met last week and decided we were going to read Faith After Doubt, Why Your Belief Stopped Working and What to Do About It by Brian McLaren. So that's at noon, and uh, the two most recent ones I mentioned are on Zoom. The first one's in person here. If that's confusing, talk to me afterwards. Be glad to get you connected with that and hooked up. Let's see. The other thing is um, we have two memorial services this week. For people that probably the majority of you don't know, so I'm going to tell you just very, very briefly about them. The one that we have on Wednesday, May 4th, is for Emily Miller. Emily was 27 when she passed away suddenly and unexpectedly down in San Antonio, and they still don't know exactly what it was, something like anaphylactic shock or, or breathing problems. They still don't exactly know what it was. But Emily was a bright, um, quirky, 
fun, sometimes the most outgoing and sometimes the shyest person. She was uh, my daughter's best friend all the way through middle school. And we are having her uh, memorial service at 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon because her family requested we do it on May the 4th because May the 4th be with you. Be with you. Right. So it's Star Wars Day. And so I think that they backed off of their concept of asking everyone to come dressed in a costume, especially Star Wars, although you can certainly do that and they would be happy to have you do that. I think um, you will hear some John Williams that day though. So uh, please keep that. If you're able to be here, that would be great. And then Saturday, May the 7th, 10 a.m., there's a memorial service for Dolores Jones. Dolores Jones, 30 some years ago, got us started on doing Christmas boxes. She is the original author that God then writ large after that. So we, she's been gone the last several years to Vermont or Maine. I knew it was up there. Gone to Maine the last several years after her husband uh, Vern passed away. She'll be um, coming back here to be laid to rest and we're going to be having a uh, reception after that. Now if you're in session, I told you last Monday night that we didn't need to help. Um, Rebecca changed her mind and so uh, Peggy Tharp may be contacting you or if you are interested in helping out with the reception uh, following the memorial service, please let Peggy know, let me know and I'll let Peggy know. Uh, so these are two former long-term members of the congregation that we're going to be celebrating this week. Dolores' memorial is at the Miles Cemetery, 10 a.m. on Saturday morning. Emily's memorial is here in the garden at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Okay? Are there any other announcements I forgot to get to? Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gretchen Smith, Director of Christian Education here. If you have a kid going to summer camp, your application for scholarships are due today. Any of our camps, scholarships, events, whatever, I see the wince, it's okay. I can always get you, um, we can forge it, it's fine. But talk to me and which one he wants to go to and we'll fill it out. I forgot to print out copies, but I can always do that. So if you are going to Buffalo Gap, Synod, or um, Mo Ranch, I need that today. Um, after worship, stick around for Sunday school, and that's all I have. Now the lovely and talented Bernadette Coffey. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. I am Bernie Coffey. I'm an elder here at St. Paul, and it is so good. I'm looking around, looking at all the faces as we come together to praise and worship God thanking him for this week, thanking him for carrying us when we couldn't carry ourselves, realizing that all together, today is the day that the Lord hath made. I, you, we will rejoice and be glad in it. See, this is the place we come, sometimes we lose that. With our children, we watch them go and they go to the football games they're telling us. I'm here to tell you, we have someone who is for us, even when we don't know what we need, who is there for us, who loves us, and who desires to have a relationship with us. Does that not make you want to come together and get filled up for the week and share with those who don't know? Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do Jesus' commands. That they may have a right to the tree of life. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come to Everyone who hears says, Let everyone who is thirsty come to the banquet table. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life, it is a gift from God. Right.
rise and join us in singing hymn number one, Holy, Holy, Holy. As we come to this portion of our service, it's a time for all of us to remember that even though we fall short, we have a God who loves us, who forgives us, and who we can boldly come to his throne and ask for strength, grace, and mercy. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen with us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us and let your word abide with us until it has wrought in us your holy will.
As far as the east is from the west, so far have our sins been removed from us. Believe the good news that we are loved. We are forgiven. embraced by God. We are called to go out and love and embrace others, friends and enemies, neighbors, people that we know, and strangers. And so I invite you to begin to act out that reconciliation we have in Jesus Christ online by turning on your cameras if you're able to, leaving us a note in the chat, or turning to those around you and greeting them. Remember, this is the sign. Don't get too close. You can say, peace be with you. And you can have the fist bump, elbow bump, if you're into that, the big hug, whatever you want. So friends, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Friends, as you find your way back to your seats, and peace to all of you online, it's good to see you. I invite you to bring, t okay, settle down, y'all. <laughs> I invite you to turn your hearts and your minds to prayer as we come before God and ask God to bless us with an understanding. O oh, gracious and holy God, as your word is preached, as it is read, as it is proclaimed in song, help us hear what you are saying to us. Help us to not just be hearers of your word, but doers also. Unclog our ears and open our lives so we may be vulnerable and sensitive to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Okay, can I have all of the children come this way? Come on up, children. Even the ones taller than me, <laughs> which is now most of them. Okay. Come on, Isabel. Ah. Come on, hop along. All right, so one of the things that Tim mentioned that we do as a congregation a lot of is, is what? He mentioned it making announcements. We feed a lot of people. We, we provided a lot of food for a lot of people. And, and why do we do that? Because people need to eat. To Be, live. Because people need to eat and food is important. Um, but but what, what's another reason? Come on up, Sam. It's nice, I guess. It's a nice thing to do. The Bible says to help the unfortunate. And the Bible tells us to do it, right? We Welcome are told. To the yes, we are told to. Go back, Sam. What does it say? Feed the hungry because each neighbor is Jesus, Matthew 25. We are told to love our neighbors. And if you love somebody, but then let them go hungry, is that loving them? No. If you say, wow, I'm really hungry, Don't and love. then I'm, I'm really sorry you're hungry, and you keep eating your sandwich, is that love? <laughs> even if you're Depends like. Depends on the tone. Even if Depends you're like, I love you. Depends on the tone. Depends I love you, I love you on the and, tone. You're starving, and I'm but sorry this is you're a really hungry. Good it's a really good sandwich. Okay, so we are called to love people, and we are called to take care of them, right? So yesterday, the uh, folks on the right of me and several others met in Odessa, and we worked on four different service projects. Mike, I believe you have photos. We made a whole bunch of bags. Do you want to open that up and see what's in those bags? Do you want to open that up and see what's in it? I'm pretty sure you know what's in it. What is in that? You have found that we have a hat. Why do you think someone, oh, and gloves, and, and food, and washcloths? Who do you think, band-aids, yeah, peanuts? Who do you think we might have made these for? People. Toothbrushes? with no drip. Do you think there might be a time of year where people need hats and gloves and socks winter. in the winter? So, yeah, it's the middle of spring right now. You know, when we originally planned to do this, it was January, and these supplies made sense, but COVID threw off our timeline a lot. So we made homeless bags. We made a lot of homeless <laughs> bags. And, oh, I forgot the washcloth. And we filled them with things that people might need when they don't have a house to live in. So you have just like, you have like friends with that. Um, on the way back. You know, so our plan, Sylvia, is not to throw it at the homeless people. <laughs> that would not be showing love. What our plan is yeah, that. Yeah, we ought to we automated. We're going to get one of those t-shirt cannons they yeah, had. That's what I was say. Okay, bring it back in. So what we're going to do, we're going to actually put these away for a few months because right now it would be a little silly to give somebody a, a, a beanie and a pair of gloves, right? Yeah. Nobody's needing their warm socks right now. But what we're going to do is we are going to, we're going to keep them in for a while until it's time. And then we're gonna put them in our vehicles. And then as we see people who might need the things that are in the bag, we're gonna give them the bags, not with a cannon, not by throwing it, but by giving it with love, right? I didn't say cannon. Uh, I know, you I write, I, you're you said correct. It with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so that is one way we show love. And I wanna, I wanna thank you guys that took your weekend. We, as you see from the pictures, we had a really good time. It was our third attempt to have this event. Um, so instead of calling it Tri-C, I had renamed it Tri-3. But we had a great time and we are glad it finally happened. And we are already planning next year's. Um, because one of the things that we like to do is show our neighbors that we love them. And so I'm actually gonna leave these up here on this table that has all these holy things 
that has the, the beads to remind us of baptism and the candle to remind us of Christ and the bread and the juice because showing love to our neighbors is being holy, isn't it? It's being a part of the kingdom of God. Sam, can you come to this side of me? And can we grab hands and can we say a prayer? It is a blessing to be here today, Creator God. It is a blessing to get to share your love and to worship you together. And it's a blessing to be a part of a community where we get to serve you. We get to be your hands and your feet and we get to give light to the world. Thank you for the chance to feed your people and thanks for the chance to love them. Let us always look to those who need and always be have hearts who give. Amen. My name is Sarah Eckel, and I'll be doing our scripture reading today. The first reading is from 2 Kings 22, 3 through 20. Now into, in the 18th year of King Josiah, the king of Shep, Sh I really did practice this, Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him count all the money brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people and have them handed over to the work workers who have oversight of the house, and have them give it to the workers who are in the house of the Lord to repair the damage to the house, to the carpenters, the builders, the masons, and for buying timber and cut stone to repair the house. However, no accounting shall be made with them for the money handed over to them, because they deal honestly. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan who read it. Then Japhon the scribe came to the king and brought back word to the king and said, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have handed it over to the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Hakim the son of Shaphan, Akbor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and As Asiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and all of Judea concerning the words of this book that have been found. For the wrath of the Lord that burns against us is great, because our ancestor did not, ancestors did not listen to the words of this book, to account in accordance with everything that is written regarding us. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Ekbor, Shaphan, and Asiah went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe, and she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke to her. Then she said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me, This is what the Lord says. Behold, I am going to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, since they have abandoned me and have burned incense to other gods, so that they may provoke me to anger and all the work of their hands. My wrath burns against this place and it shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who has sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what you shall say to him. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, regarding the words which you have heard. Since your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard that I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become an object of horror and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I have indeed heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I am going to gather you to your ancestors, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not look at all the devastation that I am going to bring on this place. So they brought back the word to the king. Our second reading is from Revelation 19, 4 through 9, and Revelation 22, 17. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the th throne, saying, Give praise to our God, all you God's bondservants, you who fear God, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let's, be, let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to God, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has prepared herself. 
It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the words, the true words of God. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of the life without cost. This is the word of God. Please rise and join me in hymn 353, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Way to nail the name, Sarah. I don't know if you all caught after the first one, she remembered the trick. So anyone that gets caught up here, this is the trick for how you handle those names. It's a dead language, and if you say it with confidence, no one will know. <laughs> That's the trick. So we're going back in time. And we're going back to this time of King Josiah with the prophetess Holva. And those things are not going to mean much to you unless you probably have a degree in ancient Near Eastern archaeology. Because we don't get into that stuff a whole lot. But let me give you a little bit of a concise history going from places that you might remember. Now, how many of you remember this guy named King David? Heard of him? Okay. So you've got King David, and King David is the second king of Israel. Who's the first king? Saul. Saul. Well done. Good. Okay, so you have Saul, you have David, and then you have Solomon, Solomon right? And then Solomon's son comes into office, and Solomon had been kind of sliding downhill, if you all remember this story. David was a man after God's own heart, as it says in the Bible. At the same time, I'm going to remind you, most of these people in the Bible do not be like them. David was a murderer, minimally an adulterer, maybe a rapist. He was 
awful, and yet still David was loved by God. There is hope for all of us, all of us. And David struggles through what it means to be king. His son Solomon comes to the throne. There's almost a coup at that point, but Solomon gets to the throne. He goes on and things continue going downhill because Solomon loves his women. women. <laughs> Solomon loves his women. He's got somewhere around a thousand wives and concubines he's ended up with. And in order to try and make the treaties that he had with everyone around him, in order to be able to have relationships with Egypt and the other surrounding nations, he takes brides in. And so part of being a good husband is making space for your wife's beliefs and understandings when they're different from yours. So he starts letting idols go up all over Israel. By the end of his life, they're everywhere. And by the time Solomon ends and his reign comes to an end, he dies and his son goes on the throne. They're everywhere. And people come in and they say, Rehoboam, we need some tax relief. Things have gotten really tough. And he says, okay, let me, let me talk to my advisors. Come back in a couple days. I'll give you an answer. And his advisors, who are all young men like him in the court, they say, you need to be tough. You need to be tougher than your dad. And so he comes in and he says, you thought my dad was hard on you? I will scourge you with scorpions, and you'll like it. And you'll say, thank you. This is a recipe for a disaster and a coup, a revolution. So you have a revolution that gets going. And the nation of Israel splits like across a Mason-Dixon line into north and south. The north continues on for just a couple hundred years. They get the name Israel. The south gets the name Judah. The north gets the name Israel, but their capital city is Samaria. Down in the south, they have Judah, and their capital is Jerusalem. So after a while, Israel gets wiped away. This is where the 10 tribes disappear off to. And there's just two that are left down here in the country of Judah with Jerusalem. By the time you get to the story of Josiah, he is the 16th king of Judah. This is about 350, 325 to 75 years after Solomon. So it's been going on a long time. It's mostly been on a downward trajectory with occasional pop up, do good, back down again. But the trajectory is pretty bad. And it's not just that they're worshiping other gods. This is the place where you get the prophets that come in and say, I don't want your sacrifices, says God. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God, treat the poor fairly, do good and justice in society. They're not doing any of this, none of it. And by the time they get to Josiah's father, Ammon, he comes onto the throne at age 22. His father, Manasseh, was understood to be the absolute worst king that Judah ever, ever had, even with the ones that followed. So Manasseh goes away. Ammon comes to the throne at age 22. He's not any better than Rehoboam, and people rise up against him. Now, this is a monarchy. This is not the French Revolution. There are no democratic ideals at this point. No one's thinking this way. They're just thinking, this king is bad. And let me tell you how bad he is. He's 22 years old. He reigns less than two years before he is killed by his personal bodyguard. That's how bad this guy is. And so he gets taken out. And you can see how bad he alone was because his wife, Jedidah, and his baby son, his young son, Josiah, are left alone. The people are fine with the family. It's him they had a problem with. So Jedidah, the queen, raises up her son that becomes King Josiah eventually. 
and you get a sense of what's going on because after he ascends to the throne, King Josiah says, it's time to clean this thing up. I want to make the temple look good again. And so they go in and they start cutting down the brush. They take away the ruined pieces. They replace them with nicer ones. And it's so bad that at the back of the temple, they find what would be for them a Bible. Imagine the church being so run down for so long that finally when someone says, go in and clean it up, they find one Bible. <laughs> and it's hidden, way in the back. Maybe I forgot to pull it out of the pulpit. And there it is. And so Hilkiah says, um, I think maybe we should tell the king about this. And so he goes to the king and he reads it to him. Because this is the way, this is not, you know, there's no audible version of the Kindle book at this time. It's read aloud to you. And so Hilkiah reads this to Josiah and it's probably the book of Deuteronomy. That's probably what they mean by the book of the law. And so the book of Deuteronomy is very clear on how you honor God. It's got both rules for worship of God and this is the place Jesus quotes where it says, love your neighbor as yourself. You thought that started in the New Testament? No, that's Deuteronomy. So it goes across this entire huge area. And King Josiah rends his garments. It's a phrase I never get to use in modern life, you know? Rending your garments, that just doesn't come up a whole lot. So he rends his garments and he says, we have to do something about this. We need to figure out what to do. And he sends for the prophetess Huldah, sends one of his folks out to go talk to her and say, this is what we found, I'm very concerned. There are really bad consequences for not following God's way. What do we do? And so they go to prophetess Huldah who lives in the second quarter of the city. Did you catch that? That's kind of a weird detail, right? Lives in the second quarter of the city and they go to her and she says, it's bad. It's really bad, but because you are trying to clean this up, you're going to forestall this a bit. You can put off the final doom that's coming. Remember, always, whenever God gives prophecy and prediction, if God is saying doom is going to come, there's always a way to get away from it. This is not a no matter what, there's going to be doom. It is a city of Nineveh, Jonah comes to you, Jonah says change, king of Nineveh says, I listen, and they change and something new happens and it's forestalled. This is sort of what's going on with King Josiah. Okay, so I want you to gather from this, King Josiah wants to be right with God. King Josiah sends for the prophetess Huldah. And over the next month, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through these women you may never have heard of. How many people had heard of Huldah before this day? <coughs> Two, three, okay. Hulda doesn't show up in any lectionary reading. That six year long cycle we have of reading out of the Old Testament, she's not in any single one of them. King Josiah shows up, but Hulda doesn't show up. She's kind of a silenced voice in here, and she's really actually pretty important. On the one hand, when I was looking at her and I was getting excited about this sermon series, I was like, look, here's this prophetess. This is unusual. This is wonderful. This is great. Josiah consults Huldah. And then as I started going in deeper, I realized, actually, this is not that unusual. Do you notice that when in the reading, Josiah sends his people off to Huldah, no one comments, and this was unusual because the men usually didn't talk to the women. This was unusual because rulers usually didn't consult women. This was a normal practice. And you can tell this because if you go to the uh, story of Deborah, you find out that Deborah, they say, this was going on because there was no one that was man enough to stand up and do it, so Deborah st stepped in as a judge. And this is not like a Carmen Dusha kind of judge. This is a war leader judge. 
So that is noteworthy, but Huldah being a prophetess is not noteworthy because it's so ordinary. And we miss these things because of our culture. God's been doing this all this time. We, we may think that we're in a new place now where we're recognizing the contributions of women and women are stepping up into equal roles in church and society and all this is new. It's not. God's been doing this all along. None of this is news. It's news to us because we have a cultural filter we put over this. Let me give you an example here. So Hulda, what was that weird little detail? She lived in the second quarter of the city. It's totally out of place because they don't comment on anybody else's address. Nothing. So you have to look into this and you find out it says she lived in Jerusalem with the Mishnah. Mishnah, if you have Jewish friends, is one of the two most important books after the Bible. You have the Bible, called the Tanakh, you have the Talmud, and you have the Mishnah. And they sometimes say she was a copyist. But oftentimes, we forget, this woman herself was what we would today call a rabbi, or a biblical scholar. She was with the Mishnah, presumably teaching it. And this is why Josiah goes to her. He's not seeking out the most obscure person. He's seeking out the best help that he can find, and Huldah is it. But we miss that because we're so used to our cultural filters of saying women didn't have a place in society. Women were not significant. They were all in the home. That's not true, even a tiny little bit. Huldah is very significant. So Huldah tells him, keep on the path that you're on, keep trying to do the right things, and you'll push this off. The doom that's coming to, to Judah will be pushed off for a little ways. And so he does this. And let me give you an idea of how bad things were. I had to write all these down because I could not remember these in my head. That was this long of a list. You keep on going to the next chapter and you find out what Josiah starts doing at the temple in Jerusalem. This gives you a sense. He had these things removed because there were statues inside the temple in Jerusalem. There were actual idols inside. You've got the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant, and then all around it, every Middle Eastern and Greek and Roman, there's not Romans at this point, Greek God that you can think of in whatever form, they're all through here in the temple. They start taking these out. He removes the temple prostitutes, both men and women. Forget that that thing existed, right? But that's going on in Jerusalem in the courts of the Lord. Outside of the entrance to the temple were these horses that were dedicated to the sun. And he has those taken away. Now I want you to think about this for just a minute because I know everyone has to have at least a little bit of a unit on Greek mythology as you go through school. So I want you to think on Greek mythology. Who is associated with the sun and with horses? Apollo. There are actually idols to Apollo in that area. He has those taken out. In addition to this, there are places where children are sacrificed alive in the temple and outside it. And to top it all off, I'm going to use the Greek and Roman names because those are more familiar to you, but these are the gods that they had inside the temple. They had Ares, the god of war, Aphrodite, the goddess of love. That's why they had the temple prostitutes. They had Zeus, king of the gods. These were all placed here by Solomon and his successors. This is how far down Judah had gone. And on top of all this, you have the wealthy taking advantage of the poor. You have people lying in court. One of the things that's in the book of Deuteronomy says, if you're a merchant, you can't have 
two different scales, one that you use for friends and one that you use for others. They have to be the same. You remember you go up to a gas pump today, right? And sometimes you get a picture of Sid Miller on the side of the gas tank with his big cowboy hat, right? You ever seen this? Pay attention, you'll find it. And Sid Miller is up there as our state elected official guaranteeing that what you are pumping at the gas pump is actually one gallon. You're actually getting a gallon. One gallon. You're actually getting a gallon. So these are things like what we have today. So Hulda is here in the middle of this. Hulda is a well-respected woman, a prophet of God. And it really is a prophet. I'm saying prophetess because that kind of catches our attention, but it's like the way that we talk now. Remember, 20 years ago, we talked about actors and actresses, and today we talk about actors because really there's not much of a difference because they both can do amazing things. So this is the same sort of thing that you've got here. This is the prophet Huldah alongside the prophet Elijah, probably working at the same time as the prophet Jeremiah. Probably they knew each other. And this woman, we don't see. Even though she's doing these amazing things, we don't put her into our stories in the lectionary. Because you know why? All of our stuff is based on what Roman Catholic priests put together between the 1920s and the 1960s. And we do occasional little updates to it. And this is why we're doing the lectionary year of the woman this year. Because there's a lot of these stories that are really important that get left out. And we need to bring them to the forefront. Here's Hulda, the most normal thing in the world, a rabbi and a teacher consulted by the king in Jerusalem. This is nothing new. One of the things, um, as we're getting ready for a trip next month to Italy, I've been reading up on Catherine of Siena. She's a saint in the Catholic Church. And Catherine of Siena died at about age 32, but before that, she did some amazing things. Those of you that are history nerds like me will remember there was a time where the Pope moved from Rome to France. He had his French chateau for about 100 years before coming back. That Catherine of Siena was the one that convinced him to move back. She wrote a letter to that Pope saying, if you're not going to be bishop, pastor, to the people in Rome, you need to resign and let someone else do the job who's willing to do it. I cannot stress enough what it's like to have someone who's not even a nun write a letter to the Pope inviting him to either step up or step down. But this has been going on through all of history. God's been active all along. It drives me nuts because we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of ordination in the Presbyterian Church for Women. Except it's not. We wrote out Louisa Woosley, who is a Cumberland Presbyterian, just like we were originally Cumberland Presbyterians back in the late 1800s. We just wrote her out of the story and go with a person that was ordained in 55 because that person was not a tobacco-chewing, uneducated, backcountry preacher that ended up baptizing more than 30,000 people. She was more prim and proper. And so we write out Louisa from the story. So part of what I want you to get with this series on the prophetesses and thinking about this with Hulda today is to become aware of what your lenses are. Because God is out there working among the people that we don't see. Sometimes we talk about the world turned upside down, right? God's kingdom turns the world upside down. It might be more accurate to say, we already have the world upside down. And sometimes we have to look at it upside down in order to see it right side up. In the world that God made, men and women are equal. In the world that God made, there's no exploitation, no lying. People work together for the good. This is God's dream and God's original intent. And sometimes we don't see that because we're accustomed to looking for something else. 
If we have someone who comes in with cerebral palsy, significant cerebral palsy, it's hard for us to listen to what that person says. We don't like hearing the stammering and the stuttering and sometimes the drool that comes out of their lips. There's nothing saying that person cannot be the mouthpiece of God to you that day. We don't listen to the folks that are over in the homeless camp because they smell, they're homeless, they are not interested in getting it together and getting off the street. Whatever rationale we have, we miss out on listening to the voices we need to listen to. One of my favorite things in the brief statement of faith in our book of confessions is talking about how the spirit gives us courage to listen to voices long silenced. We've silenced Holva. She is silenced no more. I invite you to find where you have silenced voices in your lives and begin to listen to them. When the best of me is barely breathing, when I'm not somebody I believe in, hold on to me. When I miss the light that might have stolen, when I'm Now's the time that we all continue our worship with our tithes and offering, remembering what God has given us, not only in the way of our monies, but also our talent and our time. Now's the time for us to give back a portion of what God has given to us. 
Gracias al Señor, demos gracias, demos gracias por su amor, demos gracias al Señor, demos gracias, demos gracias por su amor. Por las mañanas les amas cantar. from children in Mexico doing a vacation Bible school years ago. And so it, um, it's a song I learned from these sweet, adorable kids, and it's really meaningful to me, and maybe it'll catch on and we'll get better at it. So, Miss Bernie. Heavenly Father, as we bring forth the gifts of what you have given us. Father, we ask that you bless it, you have it accomplished what you have assigned it to. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we give you glory and honor, and we lay it all at your feet, our tithes, our time, and our talent. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, please remain standing. And we are going to say together a contemporary version of the Apostles' Creed. It's printed in your bulletin, and it will be up on the screens. But I want to encourage you, because we do this by rote so easily, I want you to think about the words that you're used to saying and the new ones as we use them. Let us say together what we believe. I believe in God the Father, ruler of all, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, was dead, and was buried. He went to the realm of the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy and universal church, the fellowship of the godly, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life eternal. Amen. Now you may be seated.
My friends, this is the Lord's table. He opens it to all of us, and all of us are invited to come and to be fed without exception. All are welcome. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift it up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Wondrous and holy Lord, it is truly right to give you thanks and praise, and we worship and glorify you, and we exalt you for the wonders that you have done throughout creation and throughout history, for pouring out your spirit upon all flesh, for making each and everything a tiny word from you, communicating your love and your glory and your wonder. We give you thanks that throughout history, even as we have turned our back on you, you have never fully turned away but come seeking us to save us and bring us home. And we give you thanks that in the fullness of time you sent your son Jesus Christ into this world to live with us, to know us from the inside out so that we could see what love is like when it is made flesh. We give you thanks that you stretched out your arms and died for us, but that the grave could not hold you and you were raised up on the third day to never ending life. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now, Lord, that as we break this bread, as we bless and share this cup, it might truly be a communion in your body and blood. Unite us with you. Unite us with one another. Give us courage and strength to return no one evil for evil, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the night on which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to them saying, this cup is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do these things remembering me.
My friends, let us pray. Thank you, God, that you nourish and sustain us, that you are always there for us. Help us to remember the sacrament all week so that we can remember you are the source of life. You are the bread that connects us one to another. You are the life that lives within us. Help us to remember, Lord, and be conscious of the fact that we are a part of you, and you take us from here and scatter us out in the world to be yeast, to be seeds, to be light. We lift up to you, Lord, all those things that we have in our hearts. And hear us now, Lord, as we join our voices together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, before we go out of here, I just want to remind you, uh, preschool and young go over in the nursery after church. Elementary can join over in with Dolan over in the St. Paul room. Adults will be with me and we're going to have talk back on sermon and anything related to that in Fellowship Hall and youth downstairs. Remember that we have many things going on this week and that wherever you go, you are called to be the hands and feet, the love, the hope that comes from Jesus Christ out in this world. Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.